you want to hurt you the most. Um, and so for us, that was kind of how we responded. And specifically around the WhatsApp line in particular, is that at the time, and, and, Dr., and Dr. T will tell you, the GBV command center only had two access points. So you could either send them a please call me and they'll call you back, or alternatively, you could dial in to the, to the hotline. They did not have a WhatsApp line at that particular point in time. So obviously, you know the living situations of ordinary South Africans. If I live in a one bedroom shack or an apartment where the guy is within earshot distance, I'm obviously not going to be able to make the call. And so that is why we, we put the WhatsApp line in place so that just like right now, you, you could be having a conversation with him whilst talking to us and saying you're in danger and you need help. And we can then be able to move you when it's safe and you absolutely don't need to show any signs that you're leaving. So I think that was really important uh, for us as an organization also because it, it really opened our eyes to even some weird ways that civil society organizations that we believe are supposed to be progressive and operating in the space aren't really doing some of the really essential work. I mean, when we spoke to even shelters, some of them do run services where they can pick you up. A lot of them don't. But even with those, it's you need to have already basically been outside the house. They're not going to assist you um, outside of that. And you're like, but you're aware of the nuances. You're aware of what it looks like when a survivor wants to leave. Something as simple as one of our survivors um, who did not take up our service and we're still very worried about her. Um, she was pregnant and the perpetrator was basically saying he doesn't want the baby because they had another child, I think like a toddler and a, a, a two-year-old. So it would basically be the third child within a short period of time. And he was like, if you, if you wanna go through with this pregnancy, you're gonna, have, you're gonna lose this baby whether you like it or not. And he was basically trying to beat the baby out of her. So she, she notified us that she wanted to leave. But then when we explained that what we can do is move you and the ki kids, but we can't move your furniture. She was like, I don't have family. All the borders are closed. My friends are in other provinces. So he's just going to get all of my stuff, everything that I've worked hard for, simply because I want to keep a baby. And I mean, having moving services for survivors would be something that we really need to start thinking about um, as, 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 as even just civil society organizations, because the fact that already you're inconveniencing survivors by making them go to the shelters, they must be the ones to leave their homes. They must be the ones inconvenienced. They must be the ones who are no longer close to schools and work. And then over and above that, you're saying they must leave all the assets that they've worked hard for with the perpetrator. It, it just, it, it boggles the mind. It doesn't make sense. And I think we need to be a little bit more responsive to what does, when you say, to, when you ask people to leave, what does leaving look like? And mm. how much do they actually lose during that process? Okay. I'll pause there for now. That's great, Mandisa. Thanks. Again, just super practical in terms of both a, a big set of problems uh, and I'll come back to you and ask a few questions about your own safety, the safety of those doing the evacuations. But I'll, I'll pause on that for a second. Uh, Ponzo, what, what, what has it meant in terms of your writing, in terms of, of what you're thinking about? So at the beginning of the, out, uh, the outbreak here in South Africa, I decided to like, quit journalism full time, you know, and uh, <laughs> much to my disappointment because I'm back here. Um, but, you know, it meant things, particularly from a journalistic point of view, it meant things are changing. It meant, uh, you know, more, I spend, I, I write features and I like spending a lot of time with um, the people that I'm interviewing. And it meant uh, a higher uh, turnout, turnout rate, you know, like having to update all the time, it meant, verifying even when there is no verification to take place. But it also meant uh, changing the way journalism works. You couldn't, especially at the, uh, the beginning of hard, what we called hard lockdown here in South Africa, which is essentially level five where most of the economy was still closed and we were trying to flatten the curve as, as we would say. And so it was quite difficult. However, it was also a matter of being uh, so incredibly 
uh, having to be sensitive about reporting on this, checking again, going back to the issues around uh, anxiety. How do I check my anxiety and make sure that I do not convey that in my journalism in the way that I report on issues? And also being cognizant of what is happening, what Mandisa and what uh, Dr. T talked about, which we were already hearing from other parts of the world. But you know, particularly for me as somebody who's really interested in gender, class and all these things uh, combined together was, okay, if in the UK we're already seeing these spikes in, in GBV, what is it going to look like in the context of South Africa that is an already incredible, incredibly violent society? What is, what are we going to, what are we going to think about or how are we going to process this in our health system that is already compromised? You know, what does this mean? Uh, COVID happened just as uh, Parliament just finished its um, NHI public hearings, you know, and there was a plan around uh, national health insurance and what it's going to look like and those progress. What does it look like now? You know, so there was a lot of uncertainty, but particularly for me as a, as, as a, as a writer, as a reporter, I thought it was important that we, how do we communicate the uncertainty without causing panic? And also, how do we, you know, uh, particularly communicate outside of just using English, and 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 make it accessible for everyone? Uh, what is happening in grassroots levels in terms of communicating to uh, uh, particularly non-English speaking parts of the country? We have eleven official languages. What does it What does it look like for the other ten? We know Afrikaans already has an established kind of linguistic system, you know, because of our past. So. That was fine, but at the other nine, what is quarantine in Isizulu or Kasetswana? How do you explain that, you know, how do you explain the importance of not hugging? I remember one of the hardest things, uh, even particularly my father is a hugger. And the first time I went home after the outbreak started in South Africa was like, you know, what does that culturally mean when we're telling uh, black people that they can't go mourn during the week, they can't go and welcome a corpse on a on a Friday evening, and they have a you know a vigil. Like, what are the social like implications of this of of of, of the disease? Was something that I found quite interesting. Mm. You're muted. Also, how do you help people to make sense of this moment? <clears throat> um, because there was so much fake, fake news going around <clears throat> that I think it was also about, um, yeah, how do you help people to make sense of the actual facts? Um, thank you, Ponzo. Naledi, what about yourself? I mean, Dr. T alluded a little bit to the Gender Commission and some of the challenges and, and ways of responding that they were thinking through there. What's it been like? Um, in terms of the Human Rights Commission? Um, well, in, at the Human Rights Commission, it's been very difficult. So we've had to become very innovative because a lot of our work is community-based, especially in terms of our human rights advocacy and education. Uh, it requires large gatherings, especially um, in communities that don't have access to technology, for example, farming communities, right? now all of a sudden we're, we're isolated from those communities and those people that need us the most right so it's been very difficult and so what we've started doing is partnering with different radio stations um, specifically local radio stations and using that as a tool to get the message across to numbers of people um, and also you know something that I think for me has become quite important at the commission, which is something I noticed when I joined a few years back, but has become even more evident for me is that, you know, when I consult with people who are bringing complaints or their problems to us, oftentimes it's men, right? We don't get so many complaints from women. And it's, you know, it speaks to obviously patriarchy and how, you know, our society set up that women's problems aren't as important. And so I, I've seen this trend where women, when they do complain, it's often not on their own behalf. It's often for someone else or on behalf of their community. And thinking about how during this pandemic, during this time, how women have been so impacted by this and how they are st still not feeling the freedom 
or the agency to be able to reach out and seek assistance, you know, where they need it for me has been, you know, something interesting, usually to be able to reach, you know, that demographic of women, we'd go to places, for example, like clinics, because most health workers are women. And so you can reach women in those ways. So now with the pandemic and the lockdown, it's been really a challenge for us. I want to just follow up with a question to you, Naledi, about mm -hmm. whether or not the Human Rights Commission has been seeing, and in some ways the, the same applies um, to, the, to the Gender Commission. Have you been seeing an increase in COVID-related violations, if that makes sense? Um, and what does that look like? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely we have, and I think definitely the other panelists will also be able to speak to this. But we've gotten many complaints in terms of healthcare services, in terms of, you know, the whole PPE and corruption issue, you know, healthcare workers telling us just how afraid they are of going to work and how, you know, they're put in this difficult position where they have to choose between their, their safety and job security because if you refuse to go to work, there's a risk of being fired, right? And then also other complaints we received in terms of uh, service delivery, you know, with, with COVID cleanliness and hygiene is, is very important, social distancing, but, you know, we know our country, there's issues of access to clean water, um, there's issues in terms of access to housing. And so this pandemic has really shown, I think, how the state has just really, really failed in many ways. Um, for me, it's really interesting how, you know, South Africans in generally were, were um, quite critical of Dr. Nkosa Nadlamini Zuma in terms of, you know, the cigarette ban and so on. But she, she holds a very important portfolio as the Minister of, of Corporate Governance, and that is municipalities, right? And municipalities are the ones who are supposed to be providing very important services like water and sewage. And all of a sudden, the discourse around her work was now about cigarettes and not about how she's holding, you know, municipalities accountable for providing the services that they are legally obligated to provide. And so for me, it's just been, you know, a very bizarre kind of thing to see. But yes, as to answer your question, as Human Rights Commission, definitely um, a lot more complaints from the health sector in particular. Did you want to add something about that, Dr. T? Yeah, absolutely. And um, because, again, being a Chapter 9 institution, um, the Commission works very closely with the South African human rights because where you may have a complaint, for example, around issues of water access, you know, for communities such as Kwakwa, for example, um, it's the Commission's work and, and job and mandate to bring a gendered lens, right, to all of those complaints. And sometimes we do joint investigations and sometimes we, we kind of refer cases across. What's also important um, is to, to, to talk about, um, for example, the issue of baby clothes. A lot of women online on Twitter were complaining that we're pregnant, we need baby clothes or our newborns are growing and the stores are not listing clothing as essential service. And as part of our direct intervention, of course, supported with um, other civil society um, advocacy actions, you know, we were able to get um, the minister to update the, the, the essential um, list in terms of shopping. And the other one where we intervened as the commission is that um, there was a court case that was brought to against the president and the minister of small business right and public administration as well and enterprise around using um, the, the idea around BEE um, when they are then deciding which businesses to, to, to prioritize in terms of relief. And so the DA was saying, no, 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 it's, they can't do that. You can't use race, right, as a marker of, 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 of impact. But we know with the history of South Africa, it's undeniable that not only is it a racial issue, but it's a gender issue. Um, it's also a, an issue of geographic, right? So the more peri-urban and rural um, 
you know, people will be uh, disproportionately impacted and then definitely women and youth and people who are disabled. And so the commission then joined that court case as amicus and our council was actually able to argue and bring, um, you know, forward that argument to the court that in fact, it shouldn't just be BE based on race, which should include youth, disabled people, um, you know, as well as um, uh, thinking of women in rural areas and other enterprises that are not you know smmes per de by definition and the court actually did um you know acknowledge the inputs and and then have tasked the minister to not only look at race but to actually then proceed to take into account um you know the different arguments that we brought so that's just one way that we can intervene use the mandate and use the powers that we have to support legislative frameworks and i think it speaks about that agility we shouldn't forget how quickly it was for us to update policy. We mustn't forget how quickly we're able to access the courts, right, to effect equality. And going after COVID, whatever that new normal is, I think it's important to grab onto these experiences and demand the same effectiveness um, that, we, that we've seen with COVID around data collection, around updates, around services that were coordinated, procurement that was central, albeit that, yes, we know there's corruption, but the point is we saw what it was for ministers to show up on a weekly basis and give updates to the country. And I think the same with gender-based violence, we need that same effort. Thanks so much, Dr. T. I'm gonna go to, to Mandisa to ask along the similar lines, but also to say, someone's asking a question anonymously, asking, um, about the victim support service bill and whether uh, you've had a chance to look at that. And if you have, uh, whether you think it's practical in terms of, you know, what we, we spoke about earlier in terms of victims, uh, survivors, so already the language is wrong, um, in terms of survivors and the need, you know, the need to leave. Um, I haven't taken a look at it uh, comprehensively yet, so I, I'm, I'm not going to respond in terms of comments. Um, but what I wanted to just ask, I'm sorry to also be asking questions whilst on the panel. Did anyone actually bring through a complaint around government legislating that we needed to have cloth masks, yet persons who live on the streets were not issued any, and they were expected to have them, and organizations then needed to go and do that work? of getting uh, 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 cloth masks for persons who live on, on the street. I just, for me, as, as, as an organization that was part of that, it was one of the biggest travesties where we were basically kind of lied to around service provision for persons living on the street in, 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 uh, in urban areas. We were told that they'd all be placed in temporary shelters. They'd been given, they would be given all, uh, they'd be given meals, they'd be given water, they'd, uh, they'd have access to services, they'd be healthcare services that are issued to them what a lie. Um, they were women who live on the street, specifically in, 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 in Johannesburg, that were kicked out of, um, of emergency sheltering because they were told that they have substance abuse issues, so they are not welcome. They were not issued with any kind of PPEs, they were not issued with blankets, they were not issued with any of those things, and they were left to fend for themselves and continue to sex work during COVID-19 level five on the streets. And I mean, it's it's those kind of, of, of issues that I think because they're such a forgotten demographic, though the issues are really not taken care of. And I, I wanted to know whether or not anybody um, had laid such complaints and if this had been brought to the attention of the commission. And if it hadn't, I, I, I think we would really like to champion that as an organization, but yeah. Um, I, 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 you had asked me a question and, 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 and I lost track because I wanted to check it. No, no, no. You said you, you couldn't speak to it because of that. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no that, uh, it was just that, that, that policy, that bill. Um, okay, cool. so I want to, I want to come back for a final question before we open it out to larger, the larger set of questions, which is around, and we've already begun to touch, touch on this a, a, a little bit. Um, but I think the one of the big questions that arises from what everyone is saying is this question about continuity of service. It's clear that when there's political will around some issues, not all, I think Mandis has just pointed to one where clearly for always for the most marginalized, for the worst affected, um, the, the road is much harder and government does much, much less. But it's clear that a lot has been done in a pretty quick time frame because of the political will. And the question all of you are raising is, you know, 
how do we make sure that we don't go back to the sense of a new normal, right? But I, I wanna ask about how, how sustainable it is to operate in a long-term way. A lot of this operation seems that it's reliant on all of your knowledge, interest, energy, that it's not necessarily system, systematized. And so this gets us to the question that I know you wanted to talk about, Ponzo, which is about the burden of care on women. Um, so maybe I'll ask you to go to speak to that a little bit before we open it up to everyone else. Like, how do we sustain this level of agility, policy responsiveness, systemic change to, you know, to fight for those who really need it, what government should have been doing all this time when we know it's women who are doing most of the work? I mean, that's an excellent question, um, Sisonke, especially when we consider the fact that, you know, what a global pandemic like this or what unexpected incidences such as COVID-19 uh, present is that they exacerbate already existing inequalities in, in, in our society. And one of them being just the unequal uh, experiences that women have whether it's working women, working class women, middle class women, and obviously to different degrees because we are very cognizant of the fact that what a middle class a woman or person experiences is not the same as a working class person. But we have seen, um, we are seeing that they, we're seeing the gaps that exist in our policies, the things that activists um, have been asking for for many years, you know, around ensuring that uh, workplaces, even in within the informal se uh, informal employment sector, are pro employees and employees are protected. We've seen it. We've seen it when even large organizations and formal uh, in in formal uh, economy in the formal economy have tried to rob people of their UIF money here in South Africa or have actually succeeded. And so when we look at it's great that we've seen this level of responsiveness that we've been able to get our leaders and the and the government and our politicians to respond so rapidly. One thing that we should ask ourselves post COVID is how do we then uh, put that into place in places where we've seen gaps? How are we going to ensure that women who work and are, have children are able to work efficiently and still be there uh, as parents? How do we ensure that it is not a one-way street? It's through policies. Paternity leave in South Africa is still only 10 days uh, in terms of the law. Very few, um, uh, very few uh, organizations have it longer. You know, what are we talking about uh, in terms of people who take care of uh, people, uh, other family members who are not necessarily their dependents? For example, I was reading the other day of a woman talking about how she wanted to add her younger siblings into her medical aid. But there's a barrier there in terms of the medical aid that her organization has chosen and also the cost of getting an adult person who's not necessarily your child or your spouse to be on a medical aid. So it's small things like that that uh, can be resolved. And, and, and we need to think about ways in which how the government, how we're creating systems that can withstand the, t uh, the, st the test of time or another crisis. And it's a pity that it's taken um, a global pandemic for us to see a functional or a responsive government. How can we see it in other ways? Think about the gender-based violence um, strategic plan, national strategic plan. This has been on the table for years. Before I was even a journalist, I learned about, this is one of the first things that I did was, was hear about the national activists asking for the national strategic plan against gender-based violence. This is about, I think you look, Sonke, you still worked at on, Gender Justice. I worked on it at Sonke Gender Justice. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, seeing those kind of uh, things taking so long, uh, realizing that 
we can actually train or uh, put money aside or ring fence money or direct money for certain causes. Why has the uh, Gender-Based Violence Command Center not operated uh, through WhatsApp before? The technology has been there, but it was the political will. And why should it take a crisis for, or for activists? You know, for me, my question is, why is our government so used to having to be pushed by South Africans, whether through civil society organizations or through individual other ways of organizing for things to be done and for things to matter? Yeah, very good question. Uh, now, Lady, do you wanna follow up on that, uh, uh, on that response? Um, yeah, so I think firstly, I'll go back to uh, Mandisa's question in terms of complaints on behalf of the homeless. <laughs> Let me see thumbs up. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we, we, we've received any of those complaints. Um, however, I would encourage you then to lodge a complaint if that's something you've seen. Um, but I think this really speaks to what Mandisa was saying was really speaks to the issue of how the state has failed so many people, so many marginalized people that now it's civil society always has to jump in and fill in the gap where the state has failed. Um, and so I think that leads into what I think we can do to sustain, you know, the, the responsiveness, not just from the state, but from people generally. I think, you know, one of the, the uh, things I'm very interested in is um, electoral systems. And there's been this conversation circulating for a while. And even now, I think opposition parties are pushing it quite a bit to that maybe we should change our electoral system or change our um, uh, elections timetable schedule. For example, if we, if we are able to elect a head of state and elect parliamentarians based on the individuals that we feel will get the job done. Now we are kind of at the mercy of the ruling party in terms of who they deploy where. You know, once you've voted them into power, then you know it's up to them to decide, you know, who gets what portfolio, who gets what position, who is deployed where. And then we effect become powerless, even though we are the ones who have given them a mandate. And so I think perhaps one way we can do this is, you know, to consider our electoral system and how, how can we adjust our electoral system to force the state to be more accountable, to force the state to, um, you know, fulfill its mandates. And then, you know, with that uh, political competitiveness, that heightened political competitiveness, then perhaps we, we may see a difference because I really think, you know, this crisis pushed our government to be responsive because I think even you know, despite the corruption and everything, I think they realize that this is really dire. This is this is one of those situations where they, they can't just be relaxed and laid back about things. And so I think, you know, for me, it starts at, at, at the top, really. Thanks, Naledi. I think that's a very interesting point. I'd love to hear a few other comments about it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to show my age here. I remember very distinctly when it was 1994 and decisions in the transition period and decisions were being made about the, the nature of the electoral system. I remember this big debate and many women were pushing for the list system, which is what we currently then adopted, right? Because the, the notion was that with a list, you would ensure that because the ruling party at the time was very progressive, with a list, you could ensure that we had the the one third women on that list, that Parliament would be would would at least have one third of women because the ANC would guarantee it. Um, and of course, I think what we've seen is a real abuse of that list system, and that I think it's a really good lesson for South Africans that just because something has short term benefits doesn't mean that the principle of it and the that in the long term it's going to pay off and work in our favor because what it has done is it's allowed the, the ruling party to just pick and choose. And that creates a patronage, allegiance to the leader in ways that very, very fundamentally undermine accountability and the integrity of the process. So I think it's such an interesting point that COVID 
forces, a crisis of this nature that speaks to the core of our democracy really forces us to rethink even things that don't seem COVID related. I think it's such a, a really interesting and, and very important point that you've made there. Dr. T, did you wanna come in on how do we sustain, what, what's gonna keep this momentum moving forward so that it's not just, we go back to the way things were pre-COVID, if, if there will ever even be a post-COVID. I mean, as a doctor, I'm curious, from a medical, will there be, and what's next? I keep worrying about what's the next virus gonna look like? Cause there's yeah. 7 billion people on this planet guys. So there's no way that this is the last thing that's gonna creep out. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, um, we, we, we are going to have to just learn to live with COVID and it's going to have to learn to live with us. Um, and it's the, that thing about viruses, right? Um, they, they, they need a host and, and as hosts of the human body, um, you know, we hope that at some point um, the, the danger of it, you know, will, will kind of, um, you know, not be so sharp. And then we hope for that to be soon, um, we, the effects of, of, of COVID on our bodies and our immune systems has to get blunted at some point. And that's really the, the hope for us all. And you are right. I mean, I used to think about how much touchy feely we were as people, right? Hugging, very quick to give, you know, a, a kiss on the cheek, a baby kiss. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not upset that strangers are now having to think twice about whether, um, you know, they are going to come into my personal bubble. And for me, as someone who works with sexual health and particularly sexual pleasure and centering issues of consent, it's important to actually learn um, consent outside of sexual interaction. And it's something I've always been arguing that consent is more than um, just the act of having sex in that two seconds just before. It's actually normalizing, right? And, and, and normalizing consent for all other interactions. And so I think for me, we can be accountable to each other just on that level. And perhaps that being very intentional and conscious about how much we just took for granted about our own persons, but also other people's space and, and um, you know, physical touch and contact. Um, but that's just aside. Um, in terms of accountability for me, I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about decolonizing global health. What does that look like? And I think for us in Africa, particularly in the region, we need to ask ourselves really, really important questions about why, for example, uh, the African continent, and it's also numbers wise, right? We use most um, condoms worldwide, yet we import every single condom into the African continent. Right now, production in China is being impacted by COVID. Um, freight and cargo, right, is being impacted by COVID. What does it mean for our sexual health if our own governments have to wait on an import of a condom from China? Before, again, in South Africa, we know that it's still young adolescent women who are black mostly at risk of new HIV infections. And so we, we need to ask about you know, innovation. We need to ask real questions about this 4IR. It can't just be a buzzword. What does it literally mean, right, for having young people um, leading in business, young people leading in innovation and in procurement? And that's just one area for me of imagining a post-COVID normal. It, it, it links very much to me to access to reproductive commodities. Right now, today, just before this call, I was with one of my colleagues on the phone because we are very worried that one of the drugs that we need um, for abortion care is, is stocked out. We can't access it. The private hospitals can't even loan us their own stock because they are out of stock. And we have to wait for imports from France, possibly in the second week of September. So what does it mean then for a country where we know that abortions are still not accessible in the public sector, right? That women are still, by virtue of deciding you don't want to carry a pregnancy to term, in South Africa, despite our constitution, that is already a vulnerable situation because of the verbal abuse you are going to encounter in the clinics, because of the continuous delays you are going to encounter. And therefore then the vultures who are selling pills via social media um, take advantage of, of women who need Tamiya's access to services. And so we need to be asking about generics. We need to be asking about pharmaceutical development. We need to be asking about registration of generics and why everything takes so long to be registered. And, and that will have a direct impact firstly on, on affordability 
for black women, it will have impact on, on, on access in terms of a rapid and rollout because even in private for those women who, who let's say are in the urban centers, it's still very expensive because of these imports, because we don't have, um, we have a slow, um, you know, generic registration process. And so those are just some of the, the more technical um, difficulties, but there are moments of, of opportunity that lie ahead. But again, if there's political will, and remember, again, a lot of our public health um, services around SRHR depend on partnerships with NGO and depend on partnerships with philanthropists. And I do have a question, and I think this is just a general question um, about my discomfort, right, with having philanthropists and NGOs, which are just happy to be proximal to government and ministers without asking the questions of accountability. Why does an NGO have to come in and patch in the gap where government fails? And it's always around SRHR. Why aren't there any NGOs in neurosurgery? Why aren't there any philanthropists in orthopedic surgery, right? So there's something about power and control and disempowering women and young girls. And then and, and we have to talk about the politics of global health and, and then imagine an, an, a, a, a time or a moment where we can then talk about decolonization. But I do think we need to be very aware of the NGO industrial complex. We need to be very aware about philanthropy and why particularly it's around issues of SRHR and why it's so easy for people to come in and out of this country, um, setting their own agendas, setting their own research questions, and just extracting bio data to go and produce and innovate elsewhere, and then come back and, and have us then being the, the importers of that, um, yeah, in a nutshell. Oof, that's like a whole nother webinar. Um, I think that's such a, yeah, such an important and, and interesting set. I remember when, when, uh, when, um, our Minister of Health insisted that she was not going to, that our government was not going to accept um, free um, PEP testing kits because they were coming as donations and that's not sustainable. Why should we take donations that when they've, they're tired of sending them to us, they'll run out and the government doesn't have a supply chain and a way to secure and make sure that those PEP kits will be provided forever. So I think those principles about how we genuinely have a right to health and a right to health is not secured by NGOs. NGOs have their own role to play. It's a really important role, but it's not as pro a provider um, because then we do get into all the kinds of difficult territory. I'm seeing lots and lots of great questions that are being sent. Um, so Mandisa, can I <clears throat> ask you one of the questions that has been sent? I'll start with you, but others can, can jump in. It's about language. So someone is saying, Language is an effective communication tool for messaging. Should we be speaking of women or women with an X? I never know how to say it. Women. <laughs> should we be speaking of victims or should we be speaking of survivors? Is this terminology just semantics or does it actually matter? And which of these should be reflected in our policies and the laws that we make, et cetera? So I'll direct that one to you. Um, but we've got quite a few questions, so then I, I might move on to a few others if other people don't want to add to that question. Language is very important. Um, and at the moment, the trend is not women with an X, it's women with an underscore. So uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, so it changes, but it's basically trying to show representation uh, of, of trans bodies, of, of gender non-conforming people in the idea of what is being a woman. And I think it's important that we do that. And I think representation matters. I am very pro uh, survivor versus victim. I, I cringe every time I hear of victim empowerment and, and those kind of things, because already you are calling me a victim and then you're saying you're empowering me. At, at what point is my power going to reside with me at what point is my agency coming back to me because most, I'm, I'm just being handed over here so I, I I'm very pro I think wording is important I think even uh when we when we design legislation and we just do policy work I think it's really important and currently the word victim is very popular around GBV legislation uh it's very popular around GBV support services and I would really love to see it eradicated personally as uh, it's just a pet peeve of mine. I think language is so important and we really 
we disempower survivors so much, man. We really do. It's exhausting how much we do. It's exhausting how much we, we feel like they don't have capacity to make their own decisions. It's exhausting how much we feel like their bodies should just be, I ha- how, do I, how do I put it? Like they, like they, they don't ha- have agency over their own bodies and what happens to them. I mean, even the way, I mean, okay, I'm going to start talking about rape kits. Let me not go there. But uh, language is important. Um, and I think we should definitely to have conversations around that and not just conversations, but I think we need to educate the public around what is the difference? What do these terms mean? Um, how, do, how do they breathe life or take life away? Um, and yeah, I'll pause there. Thank you. Then let me go to this other question that somebody asked and I'll ask anyone to comment on this, which is about the discriminatory nature. Maybe Naledi, you should take this the discriminatory nature of the lockdown regulations on level five. So the example that's been given is that one could buy veggies from the supermarket, but not a street vendor, which further disadvantaged micro enterprise. And um, so I'm just curious on your take on, on that. Oh, I absolutely agree that it's discriminatory, especially if we consider how the informal sector is dominated by black women specifically like the women selling on the, on the side of the street um, and just how the government just did not care about that sector at all did not put in any safety measures for that sector at all and we know how probably the informal sector is just going to grow now because of you know how unemployment has risen and we know that year in and a year out statistics South Africa is always telling us that the most unemployed demographic is black women. And so it's, it is really discriminatory, but I think I'm not even sure if it's a deliberate discrimination. I think it just shows a lack of care and thoughtfulness from our government. I think it shows how, you know, s- certain industries and certain work Uh, and certain people are more legitimate than others. I mean, why should the informal sector be viewed as less legitimate than the formal sector? You know, both are participants in the economy, both are contributors to the economy. And so I think it just shows um, carelessness, thoughtlessness, but I think it also shows, you know, uh, issues of class as well, right? Um, so there's so much that goes into that, but I think definitely it, it is discriminatory. Thanks. Thanks, Naledi. And I think also the very idea that if you think about the way you can buy veggies from a stall versus a Woolies, one is outdoor. So again, it, even in terms of transmission, if we, if we continue to view what is black as dirty, as unsanitary, then we continue to stigmatize it. And if we think in a very practical level at what is close to home, what prevents people from moving around a lot and spreading transmission, just purely from that public health perspective, then there's no way you could be opening a Woolies and not opening uh, and not allowing people to do the trading uh, you know, in the township. So definitely there is a bias there and a blind spot that we, we refuse to, to see. Uh, Tato is asking, hi Tato, is asking, could Ponzo please also give us a sense of how South African media has framed certain public debates around the impact of alcohol and cigarette ban on GBV statistics and policing? Uh, and the, he's saying the point made by, by Naledi on the gendered and sometimes sexist and racist criticism of Dr. Lamini Zuma's position and leadership has been centered far more than the question of state accountability for the lack of effective infrastructure to address GBV generally in the justice system. So there's a way that the media is guiding these conversations and it feels a bit skew. Um, I think that's the point he's making, but maybe you can make a comment about that, uh, Ponzo. Of course, you know, I think it's it's been evident uh, that the conversation has been skewed around big tobacco, big alcohol versus the government, uh, AKA in Gossana Glaminizuma in some way or the other. However, and, and what this does is, is that it's, it steers us away from having other conversations. 
you know, when we are finding a whole news cycle, so the, the news events and the, 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 the most newsworthy things of the day being around um, this a, a certain topic and continuously being framed in a certain way, we, there's no space to discuss other things. Uh, particularly when we think about how the, the, the role that uh, the media or that journalists play uh, in ensuring that society or the public has important health information, right? S studies show that a lot of people are health illiterate and, health, uh, and me the media is the way in which they access information about health. And so we need to ask ourselves, or more newsrooms need to ask themselves as they put together stories on COVID, what is the implication of this information to the public and their knowledge about the disease, the pandemic and everything else? And they, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated way of, 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 of thinking around reporting on a public health issue. This is not like reporting on a scandal from a political party, which is also equally important and has its place. And I think one of the most important things that COVID-19 has done um, particularly uh, has shown uh, is lacking within the media is the lack of specialized journalists. Um, uh, where health reporting and gender-based violence is something that we report on continuously and not when there are spikes in deaths, not on the anniversaries of, uh, of women who died, um, not, on, not when it is gruesome, when just as it happens. And that is something that came out particularly there. But something that I, I found quite, um, Interesting as well is I've been reading Dr. Nakama Brody's uh, book, Feminicide in South Africa, and she talks about how, you know, the information that's been used, there's, there's been a lot of misinformation or rather the, the, the incorrect use of information, particularly where statistics or numbers are not understood or are not explained. And what that does, particularly when the media is the one that is communicating those numbers out, what it does to perhaps the intention is to create awareness or to create urgency, but we need to be able to use correct information so that we do not create false narratives as Dr. Nahama Brody says there. But also from an NGO perspective, we have, I found that, you know, speaking as I'm doing stories uh, during this time is that NGOs also are, are part of the problem because they tend to, owe, uh, to exaggerate what is actually happening on the ground. And, and I understand why, and this is related to what Dr. T was talking about when she was talking about the NGO industrial complex, because that's what funders want to hear. Funders want to hear the devastation so that they can give you money to try and solve it or to bridge the gap. So the importance of using correct information particularly during a time like this is important. It is the difference between a person being able to survive or not. That is literally what is happening during this time. And then we need to also ask ourselves that how, particularly when you're looking at how we've reported on women or issues that affect women, have we, there was the big hoo-ha earlier on in South Africa of the 87,000 calls as, Be as Police Minister Beggy Taylor said. Yes, we're trying to raise awareness on, on the issue that GBV has increased. However, we need to be able to give empirical evidence that these are the numbers because we need, to, we need the truth. Whether, and we need to not use shock tactics to get people to, um, behave correctly or to decrease the gender-based violence because what we do is we also create narratives of a perfect victims or that it is only valid uh, uh, gender-based violence for example is only valid if it's this gruesome if she's the perfect victim if she was just not asking for it she wasn't at the club she wasn't out uh, out of the house over lockdown hours and therefore she you know and so it's very important that we use information and i think we can, as a, as a sector, the media can really improve on, on that part. Thanks, Ponso. I mean, it's obvious, as you say, that our media is very addicted to a particular kind of reporting, and that is episodic reporting, not long view reporting, and that it's also very much um, addicted to conflict. So you cover a story by covering conflict. You cover a story by covering uh, the breaking news of corruption. Uh, and, and that has its place, as you say, but it's not the right frame to cover 
uh, this long drawn out crisis. Someone is saying NGO industrial complex. It's the first time hearing of this phenomenon. It's such an important phrase because it really describes precisely what the, the, the way that orga NGOs organize themselves in a power block. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Someone has uh, raised a question. Tapsile has said the lockdown again brought the idea of basic income grant to prominence but there's still no policy conversation about compensating or at least supporting women for unpaid labor, um, uh, which holds up so much of our country. What might be the way forward for us while the Department for Women, Children and Disabled People seems to have no policy direction? I feel like that should be a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> So what is the way forward, guys, on that department and on basic income grant? Because if there ever were a woman-friendly COVID policy for life, it's basic income grant is my, my thought. So I'll open it out. Whoever wants to take this first, please. Because uh, I think it has implications for GBV. It has implications yeah. so much having a proper basic income grant. Yeah. I think it's so important and, and research globally shows that in fact, in, in countries where the, the, the state support um, its citizens, you know, with, with grants, it, be, it, it offers such a, an important buffer. And many of us are vulnerable at different points in our lives and for many different reasons. And so I think for me in South Africa, we need our own homegrown research and data because we need to quantify what this unremunerated labor, right, um, looks like for South Africa. And, and we need to ensure that those grants, when we are thinking long-term, when we are thinking about legislative um, changes and frameworks, we need to ensure that the grant goes hand in hand with other safety nets. For example, you may offer someone a grant, um, uh, you know, a, a, a grant because they're a woman doing unpaid work, but there may be a same woman who's using drugs who may require access to a rehabilitation center for detoxification. You can't still then go and expect that woman to do a, a down payment of 30,000 rand at a private facility because the public sector doesn't have any. What, what of her own belongings, her own safety, and those of her children, for example. So we need other civic services to be working well. Things like creches, right? Um, or what we call them early development centers that are in the community that are safe and of quality. We need playgrounds in communities that are safe because all of these intersect with other multiple human rights and, and, and make sure that they, the health system is efficient. Whereas women are not having to forfeit leave, just queuing um, every, every month for chronic medication for high blood pressure or, di or diabetes, right? We can have positive health outcomes, but you can also ensure that women are then having actually leave to actually rest and recuperate as opposed to taking leave because you need to go actually on sick leave or using sick leave to go on, on rest and recuperation. So it's important for me that the entire civic services has to work well. And giving money in people's hands, for me, is part of this decolonization of our thinking. Because suddenly, um, when it's poor Black people who need to be given money that is unconditional. Suddenly people question whether food will be bought in the household. We don't trust that black people understand how to prioritize for their own lives and make those decisions for themselves um, in, in a manner that's, that, that's you know, for their own good. So there is something about control and power, which is why if you look at how our, 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 our payment systems for social grants are the way that they are, it makes no sense for Gogos to be queuing and sleeping at night at an ATM every third week because they must go withdraw money. Why can't you give people money for three months or four months? You see what I'm saying? Like every quarter, then they can go and cash in their check or whatever it is. But even in the way that we then offer services, it's still very much undignified. And, and that speaks to a deeper problem of, of us as a country never looking at all these policies and, and legislations of apartheid time, and we took them over into democracy and started implementing them and forgot that apartheid was legislated. It wasn't just white people not liking black people. It was legislated. So if you are un going to undo all of that, 
you have to look at every single piece of legislation. And I'll give you an example, the Sterilization Act, the Immorality Act, the act that still criminalizes sex work in 2020 in South Africa. Had we taken the time to look at legislation that was criminalizing poverty, criminalizing black women, and how the health system was used as a weapon against black bodies in this country, we would be further. The problem that I think the disconnect is that citizens are experiencing government and governance and civic services in a very different way. We still find it anti-black. We find it anti-women and anti-poor. And the government is like, no, but what's your problem? It's us black people in charge. Why, why can't you never be happy? It's like, but if you are implementing a policy that's anti-black, that's racist, that's sexist, of course that's how I will experience it, regardless that it's a, it's a black government. And the same way with this zebra striping thing, let's just put all these women in charge and let them, and, 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 and then all the problems will be solved. It doesn't work that way. You still need policy in the workplace that's enabling of women to thrive and actually make sure that those women you put in those positions have political power and authority to effect change. So what we are talking about unpaid labor is actually linked to so many other systems and so many other rights and issues of access um, and enabling um, um, uh, you know, frameworks, but also ultimately for me, um, it's about accountability um, and, and really being clear about how in every sector that we work, we need to be pushing ahead um, and asking the difficult questions about accountability. Hi, Preach. I feel like we were in the, the, the church that I love, the only church, the only kind of church I will go to. Thanks, Dr. T. That was excellent. <laughs> um, we're going to have a poll and we're going to launch it at the end. So st stay tuned. We're, we're wrapping soon. Um, uh, Mandy, so did you have something to, to add here? Dr. T covered me completely. Um, I, I, I don't think I, I, I was just saying feminism viva. Um, <laughs> so there's more of an encouragement situation than saying I have anything particularly to add uh, around. Uh, I just wa wanted one thing. I didn't want to leave without mentioning one thing. The continual closing of borders has really affected survivors, especially who are migrant women. They have not been able to go back home. They remain trapped with their abusers purely because they cannot cross, cross the border and leave. There are survivors whose shelter stays are now over because they have a three to four month shelter stay and they've exhausted that shelter stay and would like to cross the border and are unable to do that. And I think we really didn't, we were not inclusive of gender-based violence and understanding what it looks like when we came up with these COVID-19 policies. There should have been some kind of backdoor mechanism that was put in place for people who want to cross and go back to their own countries and trapping them in South Africa with their South African or, or otherwise abusers is really unacceptable. And I think we really were not cognizant of what does being a migrant in South Africa look like? Um, we didn't we didn't take uh, into cognizance what that looks like in terms of, of food security, what that looks like in terms of healthcare services, if migrants would be able to access uh, ARVs and other, and other, and, and other treatment facilities, um, if migrant children would have been taken care of outside of the school system. There are so many things that happened to migrants during COVID-19 that are absolutely horrific, nothing less of human rights violations. And we have just completely forgotten about them in our fight against COVID-19. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the attention of the panel and, and others that I think that is probably for me where we lacked the most around policy and I, where we still lack. And I hope that if there is another scourge of, of, of COVID-19 and we do need to go back into hard lockdown, that we put in pro proper frameworks in place so that we can protect everyone within our borders, not just our own citizens. I think that's a really great place to, to start to close the conversation because in many ways there are those um, groups of people who represent what, what, what you call the canary in the coal mine. That if you, can, if you can ensure that those with the least access to rights, the most vulnerable are taken care of, then everybody else will absolutely be fine. Um, and so I think a failure uh, to, to protect to, to, to look out for, uh, to be mindful of um, uh, migrant women is absolutely an indicator 
um, of our failure to do a whole lot more. Um, we're going to have a poll at the end. I just wanted to summarize firstly by thanking everybody. Um, is there one last, you know, two second thing you want to say, or do people feel like they've they've exhausted themselves and are ready for that Zoom ending? <laughs> Can I say one thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'll go after that. You Dr. shouldn't have <laughs> asked. <laughs> but on that issue of grants, imagine imagine how serious our leaders would take South African women if we sued them for the violence that we have to live with under every single day. We should be paid as South African women to survive this country. You know, I'm being silly in, in terms of, uh, you know, <laughs> try to, to just be cheeky. But in all honesty, if you look at the amount of stress and, and physical manifestations of these traumas that we live with, right? Um, even when you are pregnant, before you get pregnant, in the birthing process, your children are unsafe, you are living under constant threat. Uh, what would happen, you know, if civil society and women decided that, you know what, enough is enough, because it seems that the only way the government listens is through the courts process. Yeah. And so how do we, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a thing. So be, beyond just the unpaid labor, I think we do a whole lot more um, than yeah. just even those chores around the home, just to survive in this country is really just, um, yeah. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Dr. T is t saying. I think, you know, in the conversations about the, the universal basic in income grant, I think that, you know, everyone should have access to that, but I think women should get a larger sum of money because if men and women are getting the same amount of money, it's just perpetuating the exact same thing. You're not compensating women for all the unpaid labor that we do. So I think yeah. that's something, I know people are going to say, oh, women are going to spend it on weaves and stuff. And that's another thing of policing, you know, <laughs> women, but I think- <laughs> Look how we wanna look to deal with the stress. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I also just wanted to add, Susan, we shouldn't have asked as Manalisa said, and you know, at the you know, we've been talking about government and, uh, and what they, what government or leaders need to do. For us to have women-friendly policies uh, during COVID and beyond, we need to have women-friendly leaders, right? And this goes beyond gender. We were talking earlier on about having, you know, um, the list system where we have a portion of of uh, political positions or governmental positions that have to go to women. But that's not enough because what we find is sometimes women like it's not progressive women. It's not women who can come up with policies that will make life better for, 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 for women that, 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 that dismantle the systems of oppression that are in place that make it hard for women to survive in this country. And so it's not just about having women in these spaces or in these, polit in these political positions and uh, positions of influence, but they, it's about having people who are pro-women. And I just find that sometimes, you know, having like sometimes when you're in meetings with government officials and you hear the way they sound like what uh, Naledi was talking about that, we, you know, the myth around social grants and that people have babies for, for to collect money every month. And it's, we need to really, uh, and if it's perpetuated from a point of government as well. And so we need to think about how we're communicating these messages, how government is continuously debunking the stereotypes that exist. And that the only way we can do that is if we have leaders who actually don't hate women. Absolutely. Here, here. Absolutely. Leaders who don't hate women is such a low bar, and yet we seem not to be meeting that bar. <laughs> so let me just wrap up and say thank you to all of you for an incredible conversation, which from the minute we started was full both of talking about what the problems are, but also matching every problem with a very concrete solution. It is rare in these conversations to have that happen. And that's because all of you are so engaged in solving the problems. Um, so uh, one takeaway from each of you that I kind of noted in my mind as we were, were, were talking, um, you know, Ponzo, you talked about this idea of when the media covers a story, it's not just what is said, but what is left unsaid, right? What is said influences what is left unsaid. I thought that was such an important point. Um, Naledi, you spoke consistently about 
the failure of the state and the need for communities to match those failures with a push, with a response back, which says, I demand my rights. And I thought that was a powerful set of points. Um, Mandisa, your, your, your question about why did it take so long to have a WhatsApp hotline and to evacuate survivors is really a bigger question about why has it taken us so long to match this moment in terms of the political will. And so I think it speaks in an overarching way to so much that we've talked about. And then Dr. T, your reminder, your consistent reminder of all the deep rooted systemic issues that COVID allows us to, because it goes to the most broken places in our society and how it is that we begin to fix those broken, broken places is not just by, and I think all of you said this, it's not just by thinking about what we have to do. I think it's really important to unpack who that we is. Government kind of knows what to do, but it's very clear from this conversation that progressive women who care about women's rights know what to do. And that I think is ultimately the key to figuring out what a post COVID world looks like. It is that the we is, is an unpacked we that is not just a state, but it's all of us who are gathered in this room and on this Zoom call and across South Africa right now. So I thank you so much, my sisters. So many quotes, so many t-shirts I will be making up with mottos that you said. Um, this was in a fantastic space. There's a poll. Please do the poll before you log off everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and tune in for the, for the next conversation lab, which you'll find on the socials. They'll let you know when that's gonna take place. Thank you so much, everybody. Fantastic.